We've all heard of the Sahara. Sure you have. It's the largest hot desert on the planet. A sea of sand covering an area larger than the contiguous United States. But have you ever wondered what lies beneath the sand dunes? To answer this question, we must travel deep into the past of our blue planet. Up until some 6,000 years ago, the Sahara was grassland. Humans were around at this time, not me, spreading agriculture around the planet. In the north of Africa, the color green dominated. Plenty of rainfall meant that there were lakes, rivers, pastures, and even forests. A completely different image of the Sahara from the barren landscape of today. But then, the climate started to shift. The region became parched, and the vegetation started disappearing. The wind did the rest. It took away the fine sediment after there were no plant roots to hold the ground together. Give it a couple thousands of years, and you get a familiar image of the Sahara. Sand and rocks stretching as far as the eye can see. But when it comes to volume, only a quarter of the Sahara is actually sand. The yellow sands of the Sahara are just one part of the story. The desert has many other features, such as gravel plains, salt flats, and plateaus. Makes you think if we understand the word desert correctly. For people who study such terrains, geologists, there is only one condition for defining a desert – precipitation. If an area gets little or no rain, then it's considered a desert. The Sahara certainly fits the bill. Its average annual rainfall is just 3 inches. Compare that to the nearly 45 inches a year in New York. When we look at precipitation, this sandy desert is only the third largest in the world. Number one and two are Antarctica and the Arctic. They are larger than the Sahara by millions of square miles. It sounds odd, but there is more than one type of desert. The first two are polar deserts, while the Sahara is a subtropical desert. But the difference in air temperature are staggering. In Antarctica's interior, temperatures plummet to minus 76 degrees Fahrenheit. Compare that to the highest temperature on record in the Sahara of 136 degrees Fahrenheit. But this desert has a cool side. At night, the temperature is roughly the same as the average yearly temperature in Denmark. This hot and cold roller coaster makes it hard to choose the right outfit when venturing into the Sahara. And what about the sand? How deep is it actually? The depth varies between 70 and 140 feet. That's not too deep. If you put the Statue of Liberty in a tall dune, half of it would still stick out of the sand. Its vast amounts in the Sahara were created by aeolian processes – that's Greek for wind. Over time, it blows and shapes the surface of the Earth. In dry areas with sparse vegetation, winds erode the ground much faster. That's what happened in North Africa. Under all that sand is the bedrock and cracked clay. If you started digging, you would find the same everywhere on the planet, with one important difference. There is some type of soil covering the bedrock. This is not the case in the Sahara. Because of the arid climate and a lack of vegetation, sand covers the ground below. Over the course of thousands of years, a lot of interesting finds ended up in the desert sand. For example, there are petrified tree trunks. These are essentially preserved prehistoric trees. They date back to the time when the region was lush green. In some places, the trees of this fossilized forest are at least 65 feet tall. The wood is so well preserved that you can still see the texture and knots. There are even fossilized pine cones. In 1992, scientists found glass fragments in eastern Sahara. These canary yellow glass shards were scattered across hundreds of miles. They didn't belong to an ancient civilization, although ancient Egyptians used them to make jewelry. In fact, the breastplate of King Tut had a beautiful scarab beetle centerpiece made from this desert glass. For a long time, scientists were puzzled about the true origins of these fragments. They finally concluded that the glass was around 29 million years old. It is an impact tape. If that sounds like it has something to do with the word impact, you are correct. These rocks are formed when a meteorite hits the surface of the Earth. This generates a lot of heat. 
Scientists estimate that the temperature needed to melt this mineral was close to 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Apart from the regular fine-grained sand, we also have melted sand in the Sahara. But the desert conceals other unlikely artifacts. Shark teeth are a common find in Morocco, which sits in the western part of the Sahara. What are the fossilized teeth of these marine predators doing in the middle of the desert? This part of the world looked entirely different millions of years ago. There was a sea cutting right through what is now a desert. The Trans-Saharan Seaway ran the length of present-day Algeria and Mali. It was around 165 feet deep. That was enough for all sorts of aquatic animals to inhabit it. Large catfish, sea snakes, and of course sharks lived in the area. British archaeologists even unearthed a turtle shell in Mali in the 1980s. For centuries, there was even an entire city hidden under the desert. Timgad was a Roman outpost constructed by the Emperor Trajan around the year 100 in the current era. For various reasons, its residents abandoned it around the year 700. The sands of the Sahara soon engulfed the city. It had remained hidden for nearly a thousand years. Then, in the 1700s, a Scottish explorer started digging out the city. His team first uncovered a sandstone triumphal arch 40 feet high, similar to the ones we can see in Rome and Paris today. An amphitheater soon popped out of the sand, and it was followed by well-preserved statues of Roman emperors. The Scotsman's find was so impressive that no one believed him at first. It took two more centuries for archaeologists to fully excavate the city during the 1950s. The site covers a surface as large as 10 polo fields. The ruins reveal the full mastery of Roman city planning. All the streets meet at a right angle, in what is known as an orthogonal grid. You can find the same layout in modern cities such as New York. Historians estimate that during its heyday, 10,000 people called Timgad home. Different nationalities lived here, from Romans to people of African descent. Today, more than 2.5 million people live in and around the Sahara. They are spread across 11 countries in total and their living space is growing. The desert is 10% larger than it was just a century ago. This process doesn't involve sand pouring out of the Sahara. The ecosystems on the edges of the desert simply change over time. The wind blows the soil away and vegetation dwindles, the perfect conditions for the formation of a desert landscape. These changes are happening in the Sahel, a region south of the Sahara Desert. That's why the African countries have recently come together for a project called the Great Green Wall. The primary goal is to stop the desertification of the Sahel and hold back the sands of the Sahara. Their plan is ambitious and involves planting a wall of trees from the west to the east of the African continent. The proposed forest is not only going to be long, but wide as well. The Sahara and the Sahel share a historic bond. Since antiquity, camel caravans have been making the journey from Africa's Mediterranean coast in the north to the savannas in the south. The golden age of this trade kicked off in the 9th century. The perilous journey took several months to complete. The route was two and a half times longer than the length of the Grand Canyon. Explorers still find evidence of these ancient caravans hidden away under the sands of the Sahara. Under the burning sun, among the sand dunes, somewhere in the Sahara Desert, you're walking in search of an ancient treasure. Finally, you find a strange rock in the sand. It's big, looks like a large piece of black coal or rock, but something shiny on its surface makes the rock unusual. This unique find is the oldest thing that has ever been discovered on our planet. This rock was born long before Earth appeared in outer space. The unusual meteorite was found in 2020 in a remote area of the Sahara Desert. Scientists have analyzed the isotopes of magnesium and aluminum on the stone's surface and found that its age is about 4.5 billion years. At the moment, this is the oldest sample of magma from space in history. It belongs to a small protoplanet that didn't have time to form completely. It happened a very long time ago when our solar system was forming. 
Many huge asteroids were floating in space. Some of them were formed into huge celestial bodies, which later became planets. The big rocky planets were absorbing the smaller ones. The rock was part of a little protoplanet that just began its formation, but another huge asteroid destroyed it. The planet shattered into billions of pieces. Some of them became part of other planets, some flew outside the solar system, and one piece that had been wandering in space until our Earth was formed. After that, it hit the planet's atmosphere and fell into the territory now known as the Sahara Desert. The rock was discovered in 2020, but the erosion of extraterrestrial rocks shows that it could have fallen much earlier. This ancient thing weighing around 70 pounds has several pieces of different meteorites inside. In simple words, it's a volcanic rock consisting of lava. It has cooled, solidified, and crystallized. That's why you notice the glitter. Scientists hope that further study of the rock will help to learn more about our solar system foundation. The biggest asteroid discovered in the U.S. is the Willamette. Its size is 84 square feet, and its weight is more than 15 tons. This is half the weight of a bus. Several people can fit on the surface of this outer space object. But the coolest thing is that it's not a rock like most meteorites that were found. Willamette is made of nickel and iron. This massive piece of metal was discovered in 1906. Now, the huge rock is kept at the American Museum of Natural History. The largest meteorite ever found is Hoba. It's located in Namibia, and people have never changed its position because it's too heavy. The weight of Hoba is 60 tons. It's heavier than a tank. The next space-related event occurred on February 28th in southwest England. On this day, a huge flash lit up the sky. Then there was a loud crash. Several residents opened the doors of their houses and noticed a black sooty spot on the lawn. They immediately guessed what had happened and reported the discovery to the British Meteorite Observation Network. If you ever find a meteorite, report it to some geological research or space center as soon as possible. The longer a space rock lies on the ground, the faster it loses its value. Rain, dust, snow, wind, scorching sun, all these factors damage the surface of the meteorite. It makes it difficult to study the celestial object. The meteorite found in England looks like coal, but it's way softer and more fragile. It most likely used to contain frozen water. The rock is part of a huge asteroid that plowed through outer space when our solar system hadn't fully formed yet. They found a unique combination of minerals inside the rock. It can help scientists learn more about the origins of the solar system and life on Earth. Now we're heading to Germany, to the small town of Nördlingen. A huge ancient meteorite's hidden here. It's very difficult to notice it unless you know the secret of this town. You're walking along the cozy little streets and looking at the buildings with beautiful architecture. You spend the whole day there and don't find anything that reminds you of a meteorite. To solve the mystery, you need to get out of town. So you climb a high hill and see that the city is located inside a pit. For a long time, locals were sure the house was located in the crater of an extinct volcano. If you look at the houses from a certain angle, you may notice an unusual shining coming from them. In the middle of the 20th century, a group of geologists came here and immediately declared that the crater doesn't look like a volcanic one. The town was built on a huge crater left by a meteorite. The huge celestial body fell here about 15 million years ago. It was so hot that the carbon bubbles inside instantly turned into small diamonds. When people were building this city, they didn't know they were using expensive stones, since the diamonds were hardly visible. The locals never attached importance to the fact that the city walls shine unusually in the sun. Now they believe this place was built from diamonds that had fallen from the sky. Our next stop is in the UK again. This time, the rocks are of an earthly origin. The famous Stonehenge. People place circles of rocks here in a certain order. Everyone knows about this archaeological monument, but no one knows the reason for its creation for certain. Another construction built out of mysterious rocks was discovered just two miles away. It's called Superhenge. It's bigger, heavier, and takes up more space. Each plate here is 15 feet, which is about the height of two floors. Once, the stone stood vertically and formed a huge semicircle. But someone pushed the stones over about 4,500 years ago. 
It was a college prank. No, not really. That's why they couldn't be detected for a long time. Scientists still can't solve the mystery of Superhenge, but they believe the standing vertical stones were part of some huge monument. Some other amazing rocks are located in the south of Costa Rica. There are big ones the size of a human, and there are smaller ones the size of bowling balls. And they all have a perfectly round shape. These giant rocky spheres were created by people. It must have taken years of polishing using stone tools to get the perfect round shape. These balls are incredibly heavy, but can easily roll like a basketball. All the rocks are of a different age. Some of them were created about 2,500 years ago. Most of them are made of molten volcanic magma. Until now, scientists don't know for what purpose these stones were used. They were found in different parts of Costa Rica, near big cities. It's possible that ancient civilizations installed them specifically to show the greatness of local kings. Also, many experts believe the rocks were used as a tool for studying astronomy. The people who knew their purpose of the rocks had disappeared, and the history of the stones was lost along with them. Let's finish our journey with the coolest archaeological find. You're walking through the desert of Peru and climbing a low hill. You look down and notice the surface of the hill is covered with strange lines. You walk far away and see a huge cat on the hill. Such a drawing is called a geoglyph. Its length is around 120 feet, which is about half the size of a Boeing commercial jet. Archaeologists discovered the giant cat in 2020 and found out that it had been created somewhere between 200 and 100 BCE. This huge drawing is part of a mysterious group of different pictures. In addition to the cat, there are other animals, plants, and fantastic figures. All of them were found in the desert of Peru. The kitten was found by chance. Archaeologists didn't see it at first because natural erosion on the hillside had almost erased the silhouette. There are many myths around arguably the greatest structure ever built by humans the Great Wall of China. Some say it's so grand that it's visible from space. Others claim that you can see it from as far as the moon. Other theories suggest that the builders of the wall were left inside. Well, sorry to disappoint you, but all these impressive stories are just myths. But even with those stories busted, the Great Wall of China is an impressive and truly breathtaking structure. So let me tell you its true story. Today, China is one of the most populated countries in the world, counting as many as 1.4 billion residents. It's also one of the oldest nations in the world. It has 3,500 years of continuous written history. But the civilization existed long before that. There is a theory that while the European continent, for example, was most likely reached by humans from Africa, China wasn't populated by settlers that came from somewhere else. Some people believe that the Chinese civilization got formed from local Stone Age people who lived on the territory since the prehistoric period. So now, the Great Wall of China. It's truly big even by today's standard, stretching for over 13,000 miles. To imagine it better, it's almost five times the distance between New York and Los Angeles or even a bit greater than the distance between the North and South Poles. Even in modern times, people have never built anything close to this big. Of course, it didn't take a day to build the Great Wall of China. Two? Eh, keep going. In fact, the wall was being built for centuries. Maybe you know that ancient cities had walls around them to protect themselves from invaders. Yes, Chinese cities had them too. The first Chinese emperor united the country in 220 BCE and got a brilliant but very ambitious idea to turn all city walls into one big wall that would defend the country's border against attacks from the north. A trusted general directed the construction, enrolling a big group of workers, soldiers, commoners, and convicts. Back then, the wall was built of rammed earth and wood. In some places that were strategically important, the sections of the wall overlap to provide maximum security. The walls were around 26 feet high on average. But the Great Wall didn't yet look like the construction we know today. 
every next emperor would pick up the big wall project, strengthening and extending it, repairing, but also modernizing construction techniques. Some used bricks to build it, others moved on to granite and marble blocks. Watchtowers and platforms weren't there from the beginning as well. They were added by Ming emperors. The watchtowers made it possible to communicate with other parts of the wall through smoke and fire messages. So, the wall is quite inconsistent in terms of material, but it only adds more charm to the construction and shows how much effort and time it took. The reasons why some parts of the wall have been standing for centuries and are still in good condition is glutinous rice flour. Turns out, this sticky rice mortar is almost like cement. It's very strong and waterproof, sealing the bricks so tightly together that even sneaky weeds can't grow between them. You may also notice that some bricks have writings carved on them. They were left by the workers who were building the wall. The purpose of those writings is quality assurance. They contain such information as location, quantity, and responsible officials. So, in the case of some problems with the quality of materials or constructions, it would be known who should be held accountable for it. Recently, a research group has looked through official historical documents of the Ming Dynasty that ruled China from the 14th to the 17th centuries. They came across records of secret doors in the Great Wall. So they decided to find them. They used a flying robot to capture continuous centimeter resolution photos of the wall. They photographed 90% of the wall that was built during the Ming Dynasty and discovered the remains of over 220 secret doors along the wall. Some of them have a specific width and height that allows only one person to go through. Others are large enough to allow two horses to pass at the same time. Why are the doors there? Well, the Great Wall's main goal was to protect the country from the enemy. Building doors that could let the enemy in would undermine the whole point of having a wall. So, of course, the doors were secret passages. They perfectly matched the surroundings topographically. And the exit on the outside was camouflaged with bricks so that it was almost completely indistinguishable from the brick wall. The wall was never just a defensive wall, and it was never completely closed. It could be opened on demand. It was also a structure used for trade and commerce, communication between inside and outside the wall, and of course, for defense and spying. Some doors were used for trade with the other side. Through smaller doors, a person would sneak out to spy on the enemy that lived on the other side. The hidden gates were also useful for a sudden attack. As you remember, some gates were camouflaged with brick on the outside. The exit was so indistinguishable that the enemy had no idea exactly where it was located. The inside entrance for Chinese soldiers was hollow, so they could walk through the wall and break the camouflaged exit gate from the inside, starting their surprise attack. Now, even though the main point was to prevent outsiders from getting into the city, the wall wasn't too effective on that matter. It could still be climbed over or marched around. So the wall was being watched at all times, and the guards gave signals to the troops if they saw the enemy approach. Also, the wall provided more time to mobilize and bulk up the country's forces or lure the enemy troops into a difficult strategic position. The construction stopped at the end of the 19th century. The wall lost its strategic and military importance due to technological advances. Over the centuries to today, only 8% of the Great Wall is in good condition, and the rest is damaged. Also, around one-third of the wall has disappeared without a trace, due to both natural erosion and human damage. I guess you could say it's now just a pretty good wall. As you remember, the first parts of the wall were built out of rammed earth and wood. These are not the most unfailing materials if we're talking about thousands of years. Also, destructive farming methods have turned large areas into a desert and contributed to erosion. Also, many bricks were taken away from the wall in the last century to be used in building farms and houses. The wall is being deconstructed stone by stone even today, but this time by tourists. Quite a few of them take a stone as a souvenir. That's a total of a lot of stones, considering that over 10 million tourists visit the Great Wall every year.
Since 1987, the wall has been a UNESCO World Heritage Site, highlighting that it has an outstanding importance to humanity. The wall is one of China's 56 World Heritage Sites, second place among countries with landmarks protected by UNESCO. Who's first, you ask? Well, the top spot, with 58 World Heritage Sites, belongs to Italy. And do you know that the wall isn't only a famous tourist attraction, but also the location of the Great Wall Marathon? It's a marathon that was established in 1999 and is one of the most challenging ones in the world. You guessed right, people run along the wall, including all the steps. There are three distances, so that participants can run a full marathon that is 26 miles, a half marathon that's 13 miles, or just have a fun run of 5 miles. It was the beginning of the 20th century, and two rivals, Robert Scott and Roald Amundsen, set on their expeditions to become the first people in history to reach the South Pole. The race wasn't easy, and it ended tragically for Scott. Amundsen has won and set his tent on the pole before his rivals. A member of Scott's expedition known as Terra Nova, British geologist Thomas Griffith Taylor, not only survived the harsh conditions, but also made an unexpected discovery. He found a waterfall of what appeared to be blood at the rocky base of the glacier, which now has his name, in 1911. It took scientists more than a century to figure out what is behind the eerie coloring. A team of American scientists journeyed to Taylor Glacier with powerful electron microscopes to analyze its contents. Previous studies had scratched the surface of the Crimson Enigma, but no one had previously done a full-scale analysis of its mineralogical makeup. These researchers unleashed a whole arsenal of analytical equipment and spotted little iron-rich nanospheres. These teeny tiny particles, a hundredth the size of human red blood cells, originate from ancient microbes. They flourish abundantly in the meltwaters of Taylor Glacier. These nanospheres are jam-packed with iron, silicon, calcium, aluminum, and sodium, forming a unique composition that paints the subglacial water a vivid shade of red. These nanospheres don't have the usual crystalline structure found in minerals, which is why previous detection methods failed to spot them. Taylor Glacier's icy depths harbor an ancient microbial community that has thrived in isolation for thousands or possibly even millions of years. This discovery could help us in the search for life outside of Earth. Dr. Ken Levy, a research scientist at Johns Hopkins University, has some impressive expertise in planetary materials and the analysis of Martian samples. He decided to find out what would happen if a Mars rover landed in Antarctica. Could it figure out what makes bloodfalls so mesmerizingly red? So, researchers treated bloodfalls as a simulated Martian landing site. They used techniques inspired by the rovers exploring the red planet. The samples they collected were sent to Johns Hopkins processing facilities. There, Livy unleashed the power of transmission electron microscopy and revealed the enigmatic nanospheres. He made the conclusion that our current methods of analyzing other planets' surfaces with rovers fall short. They can't unravel the true nature of environmental materials, especially on chilly planets like Mars. These materials might be super tiny and non-crystalline, throwing off our detection methods. To truly grasp the essence of rocky planets, we'll need transmission electron microscopes. Strapping one onto a Mars rover isn't feasible yet, but it could mean a start of a new era in space exploration. Have you ever seen a waterfall on fire? Every February, when the stars align just right, Horsetail Fall in Yosemite National Park gets a sensational makeover. As the sun sets, its rays hit the waterfall at the perfect angle, transforming it into a blazing display of vibrant orange and red hues. We don't know exactly who and when discovered this natural miracle. The original valley dwellers may have known about it, but they kept it to themselves. It wasn't until 1973 that photographer Galen Rowell captured the first known photo of the waterfall bringing it into the limelight. Since then, the firefall has become a global sensation, spreading like wildfire on social media and drawing crowds from far and wide. This magnificent cascade draws hundreds of spectators every year, but they can only see the show under certain conditions. First things first, 
Horsetail Fall needs a flowing stream. If there's not enough snowpack in February, the waterfall won't have enough water to create the magic. The temperatures must be warm enough to melt the snowpack during the day. If it's too chilly, the snow will stay frozen, and the fiery spectacle won't ignite. Second, we need a clear western sky at sunset. Those sunbeams need a straight path to hit Horsetail Fall and make it come alive. And since the weather in Yosemite is ever-changing, clouds can magically clear up just in time for the show. If all the conditions are just right, you'll witness the Yosemite Firefall in all its glory for about 10 minutes. The mystery of the Sailing Stones in California's Death Valley National Park has puzzled scientists for years. Heavy stones seem to have a mind of their own and move across racetrack playa, a dried up lake bed. They leave behind a trail on the cracked mud. There were all kinds of theories to explain this phenomenon, from magnetic fields or dust devils, which are strong whirlwinds, to mischievous pranksters. No one has actually witnessed these rocks in action, which only added to the mystery. In 2006, a NASA scientist named Ralph Lorenz entered the scene. He was studying weather conditions on other planets, but he couldn't resist the allure of Death Valley and those elusive sailing stones. He had an eureka moment while tinkering at his kitchen table with a Tupperware container. Lorenz filled the container with water, leaving a small rock poking out, and chucked it in the freezer. Then he placed this icy construction in a big tray of water with sand at the bottom and gently blew on it. The rock began to glide across the water, leaving a trail in the sand. Lorenz had been studying how ice can make big rocks float and move along tidal beaches in the Arctic Sea. Applying this knowledge, he and his research team figured out that, under certain winter conditions in Death Valley, enough water and ice could form to make the rocks float across racetrack playa in a light breeze. And as they glided, they left their mark in the muddy terrain. The River of Five Colors, Cano Cristales in Colombia, has the unofficial title of the most beautiful river in the world. For most of the year, it looks like any other regular river. The real magic happens between the wet and dry seasons when the water level is just perfect. This unique river floor is lined with a special plant, and when the conditions are right, it bursts into a dazzling display of colors. Think vibrant reds, stunning yellows, and lush greens, all mingling with the blue water. It's like stepping into a living rainbow with a thousand shades in between. This phenomenal display only lasts for a few weeks, from September through November. During Colombia's wet season, the river flows too fast and deep, covering up the river floor and denying the plant the sunlight it needs to turn red. And in the dry season, there's simply not enough water to support the vibrant life in the river. So you have to catch it at just the right time. The reason behind Maldivian beaches glowing in the dark at night isn't a mystery, but it doesn't make them any less impressive. It happens thanks to the bioluminescent plankton. These tiny creatures are like little underwater disco balls, emitting a cool blue glow when they are agitated or on the move. Imagine walking along the shoreline and leaving behind glowing footprints. You can even take a night swim amongst these magical plankton. Researchers have discovered that their bioluminescence is actually a clever defense mechanism against predators. When these microorganisms flash their little blue lights, it disorients and surprises their attackers. The plankton produces this light using a chemical called luciferin. These enchanting plankton can appear at any time of the year. The best chances of seeing them in all their glowing glory are from June to December. During this period, there's a higher volume of plankton in the seas of the Maldives creating the perfect conditions for a luminous show after the sun sets and the night sky takes over. You'll only witness the magic of bioluminescent plankton when tidal currents bring them close to the shore in large numbers. It's hard to predict exactly when this spectacular show will happen, so make sure to do your research and prepare to take photos with a high ISO to capture it, exactly like it looks in travel catalogs. You wake up with a start, open your eyes, and look around. Oh, you're inside your sleeping capsule. Its walls are littered with different buttons and tiny screens. You press one of them, and one of the sliding panels sweeps to the side. You crawl out of your pod and start another regular day on the moon. Or maybe you open your eyes and come up to the window to have a look at the weather outside. 
everything seems to be as usual. Blue trees, purple sky, and low-hanging yellowish clouds. Great, you won't need your acid rain protection today. Or maybe you'll open your eyes to the dry plains of the red planet. You'll eat your 3D printed breakfast and set off on a trip to Olympus Mons, the largest volcano on Mars. You've been planning this climb for ages. Whatever scenario it is, one thing is glaringly clear. You're not living on Earth. Why? There might be a few reasons why people could have abandoned our beautiful green paradise. The sun might have grown too old and started to expand, burning vegetation, boiling the oceans, and leaving Earth uninhabitable. Or it was probably a collision with the Andromeda galaxy. Yes, the one that is bound to crash into the Milky Way in about 4.5 billion years. It could have been a wandering asteroid, large enough to destroy all kinds of life on our planet. Of course, these days, astronomers have their own ways of spotting such space intruders. But what if their equipment malfunctioned? It would end badly for Earth and Earthlings. A much sadder reason for us to leave our beloved planet would be our own actions and the risks we pose to it. According to statistics, these days, the onslaught of droughts, earthquakes, floods, and epic storms is triple the number from the 1980s and almost 54 times that of 1901. Climate change could lead to water shortages, a severe lack of food, and the submersion of coastal regions. If it all went too far, we'd have to conserve the planet to save at least some of its flora and fauna. Then, it would become a nature reserve the remaining people would sometimes visit. But if not on Earth, where would humanity live? Surprisingly, there are quite a few options. For example, we could dig several feet beneath the surface of the moon and build our bases there. Or the first towns on the moon might be built in craters and covered with protective materials like plastic reinforced with a net made of titanium and UV-resistant superfiber. The inhabitants would have to access their homes through airlock entrances dug into a mound. Or we could skip the moon altogether and set off towards the moons of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, or Neptune. Yes, they're much farther from the sun and probably way too cold for us. But on the bright side, these moons are believed to contain vast amounts of water, carbon, and nitrogen. And still, the most likely destination is Mars. Unlike the Moon, which has a very, very weak atmosphere that consists of unusual gases, Mars has a bit denser atmosphere, even though it's still about 100 times less dense than the atmosphere of our home planet. In any case, it can offer us some protection against harmful space radiation. Mars also has about 40% of Earth's gravity, which is not that bad we could probably get used to it with time. Plus, there's water ice on the red planet. The soil there contains enough carbon to grow plants. With time, the planet could be terraformed with the help of water from underground ice or imported from an ice asteroid. We'd use this water to form a thin ocean and maybe even create a breathable atmosphere. Or we could find an exoplanet that has all the resources to support life. An exoplanet is a planet outside our solar system. It would probably be much easier for us to find a world that would be perfect for us, rather than reconstruct the already existing world with its own workings. Imagine traveling 10,000 years into the future. What would our planet look like? Would there be giant volcanoes? Would most of its surface be covered with oceans? And what if we traveled even farther, one billion years in the future? Now, Earth is about 4.5 billion years old, and when it formed, it looked very different from now. It was an extremely hot world, drowning in molten magma. Then, over the course of a few hundred million years, the planet began to cool. That's when the oceans filled with liquid water appeared on its surface. Heavy elements, initially floating on the surface of this bizarre Earth, started sinking past the oceans and magma toward the center of the planet. Earth became layered. The outermost layer was a solid covering made out of relatively light material, while the denser substances sank to the center of the planet. That's how it all began. Now, speaking about such a distant future and one billion years is no joke, 
the chances that humans will still be around are very slim. You see, there are quite a lot of threats the human race might face in the process of its development. Climate change, overpopulation, falling asteroids and comets, ice ages, the sun getting hotter. Let's say you've got your hands on a time machine and on your way to see what our planet will look like in a billion of years, you make a few stops. And the first one is 10,000 years into the future. One of the main changes is the appearance of people. Apparently, genetic differences are no longer regional. Such traits as skin tone or hair and eye color are evenly distributed around the globe. 20,000 into the future, and you don't understand people anymore. None of the current languages is recognizable, and the language people speak only has 1% of the present-day vocabulary. Moving further, 50,000 years into the future, and you realize with horror that a new ice age has started. Niagara Falls have eroded, and a day on Earth has increased by one second. Your next stop is 250,000 years from now. The landscape of the planet has changed a bit. For example, a new island has formed in Hawaii. After exiting your time machine 500,000 years into the future, you realize you might have made a mistake. Fires are raging all over the planet and the air is nearly unbreathable. The reason is a giant asteroid. People didn't manage to prevent it from hitting Earth. You hop into your time machine and set the timer to one million years from now. It seems you're out of luck. This time, it's a massive supervolcano eruption, spewing out hundreds of cubic miles of ash. It's already produced enough lava to fill 75% of the Grand Canyon. Two million years into the future, and people have created settlements all over the solar system. Humans look different on different planets and moons since their bodies have adapted to particular conditions existing in those regions. 50 million years into the future, and you see that Earth is still changing. A massive part of eastern Africa has broken off, forming a new ocean basin. Africa has crashed into Eurasia and closed off the Mediterranean Sea. A new mountain range, higher than Mount Everest, has formed between these two landmasses. Also, Mars has collided with its moon and got a cool ring system, just like Saturn. You make a stop 600 million years into the future and find out that a gamma ray burst has occurred around 6,500 light years away from Earth. Luckily, it hasn't hit our planet. Otherwise, there would no longer be the protective ozone layer and it would have caused a mass extinction. Also, the moon is now so far from Earth that there are no more total solar eclipses. And now, your final destination. Earth one billion years from now. With bated breath, you leave your time machine and freeze in shock. Our once beautiful planet has turned into a lifeless desert. The levels of carbon dioxide have dropped dramatically and there's no photosynthesis anymore. It means that free oxygen and ozone have disappeared from the atmosphere and there's no more complex life on the planet. Plus, the sun's luminosity has increased by 10%, making average temperatures on Earth rise at least twice. You feel as if you're standing in a giant damp greenhouse. The oceans have evaporated, leaving a few small pockets of water at the poles. What about people? You won't find them on Earth. By now, they have already colonized some faraway planets and faraway galaxies. You should probably leave this inhospitable world too.